We're called the Companions of the Cross. It wasn't the name I chose, I can tell you that. I would have liked something like the uh, Disciples of the Glorious Resurrection of the Triumphant God. <laughs> or something like that. But we got the cross. The everyday cross, the vicissitudes of life. We all experience them. These are things that we can add to the sufferings of Christ. But you know, we suffer so many things without even thinking about it. Slipping on the ice, falling backwards, you know, trying to get in our back door with the time that Archbishop Prendergast pushed me. Um, <laughs> falling on the cement, and so on. That kind of stuff. Being attacked, being attacked, being beaten, being shot at, being part of a tragedy. I was part of that. That happened in my classroom in 1975. One of the students came in and, with a sawed-off shotgun and shot, hitting eight or nine, killing one, then killing himself. I thought I thought I was, thought I was finished, but the aftermath of that was just horrible. The boy that was shot and finally died died a month later. We went through the whole pain again. A month after that, the inquest we went through the whole thing again. A you know, disgrace before the entire nation. In this particular school, in this particular classroom, with this particular teacher, namely me. I went through that. I know what pain is. I really do. I, I don't just talk about pain as something theoretical. I talk about it as being very, very real. The Lord brought me through that, and I have to say as a very miraculous way. Very miraculous. Psychological pain. Oh, how many people are walking the streets today depressed? How many people are dealing with, with schizophrenia and chemical stuff and all that kind of stuff? And nobody else understands it. Say, oh, they're crazy. They're not crazy at all. They're sick. They're ill. I know what that is, too. Because in 1995... Trying to do absolutely everything in the community, I was the moderator, the moderator, being responsible to everybody, getting the criticism, overseeing the administration, the admissions, uh, doing a lot of talking, representing to the school board, representing to the bishop, to trying to deal with any problems with the priests or the seminary and so on. I was doing everything. I was working myself to death, really. My, my bedroom was my life. There was my bed, there was my desk. I slept beside my desk. I worked beside my bed, morning, noon, and night, seven days a week, without ever getting much of a holiday. I hit the wall. I hit the wall like you wouldn't believe. A major burnout. It affected my sleep, my energy, and my interest. I couldn't sleep without being medicated finally. I had no energy to do it. I couldn't do a thing. I couldn't even read. And I lost interest. I didn't give a damn anyway. Who cares? Let the whole, yeah, I can't do anything about it. Blah. Finally, my doctor says, you're depressed. I said, don't be ridiculous. I've never been depressed in my life. He says, because you don't understand what it is, he said. I said, okay, fine. What is it? He said, it's a chemical thing. It's to have the, the brain or whatever the body's supposed to be producing certain things it's not producing enough of, and you're experiencing the symptoms of depression, which are loss of energy, loss of sleep, and loss of interest. I said, is that depression? He said, yeah, that's it. I said, well, I'm depressed then. <laughs> I didn't know that. I'm depressed. He says, furthermore, I think you need to go over to the Royal Ottawa Hospital to get an assessment. I said, What? The next day, I couldn't believe it. I was turning my car into the RO. <laughs> doctor came out, talked to me for about 10 minutes. He said, oh, yes, you're severely depressed. Not only that, he said, you need to be hospitalized right away. The next day, the two young men that were working with me in the office delivered me to the Royal Ottawa. I wound up in the fifth floor of some building with people that were all at least 20 years younger than I was, some of them horribly sick. I said, well... This is where I belong. I couldn't believe it. That's when the emotional depression hit me. I wasn't angry at God. 
I didn't understand it. Uh, the only answer I could come up with was that the God was finished with me. He didn't need me anymore. He had done through me different things, and that was great. But now he, I'm finished. And this is it. I'm dying, probably a slow death, and that's the way it is. The only thing I could do was sit on the edge of my bed and rock back and forth. I was a basket case, literally. However, five weeks later, and seven shock treatments later, they let me go. But after three months, I felt better than I had in 30 years. And the doctors who had seen me uh, said, how are you feeling? I said, I'm great. I haven't felt this good in 30 years. He said, you're not supposed to, you know. I said, well, tough, I can't help it. My apologies, but I feel great. And I have ever since. And Dr. Muir and Dr. Bob McDonald said the same thing. This is the hand of God. He has brought you back. But he allowed me to get to the very bottom of psychological illness. But God had a purpose. He made me more compassionate. He made me more understanding. And he gave me an opportunity to offer suffering to him. Suffering, then, you see, is not necessarily all bad. Sure, it's bad. But it's an opportunity to participate in the sufferings of Christ. That's what it is. So, if you can remember one thing, it would be this. Don't waste pain. Don't waste it. Give it to God. He can do something with it. He adds it to the sufferings of Jesus, and grace pours out upon other people. Don't waste pain. Offer it to God.